Okay, so now that we've come up with a good conceptual definition and come up with an operational definition of how we're going to go about measuring that concept, another important thing for us to think about is measurement error. And this is really important in terms of social welfare research. And a lot of people say that social welfare research is somewhat of a soft science because all types of research are going to have some type of built-in measurement error. Um, but there are a lot of ways that researchers can prevent this from impacting the validity of their results and the validity of their measurements. Your book talks a little bit at first about systematic measurement error. So systematic is something that's predictable. Things that we can adjust for or kind of predict ahead of time and make sure that it's not contaminating our data. So the first example of predictable or systematic measurement error is social desirability. So your book talks about having an interviewer ask about race in regards to election polling, but you could imagine a ton of different questions where this would come into play and how somebody not wanting to be perceived as racist or sexist or simply just wanting to go along with what they think that the researcher would agree with um, could influence the way that people would respond to questions. An example that I could think of questions about sexual history. I can imagine a scenario where if a man was asking a question about sexual history, I might get a little bit different response than if a female were to ask somebody about their sexual history. Based upon somebody's ideas of what the researcher would want or how comfortable they were sharing with them or how they thought that the researcher was going to judge them is probably most pertinent to this one. So how do you think a researcher could try to eliminate this threat to the validity of their study? One way is to make sure that they feel comfortable with the person who's asking questions, obviously, but also to make sure that they feel that it would be comfortable for them to express their emotions and not be judged for it or express their thoughts in an honest way. Um, sometimes this may be asking questions that are a little bit more sensitive uh, via computer as opposed to a live interview, perhaps a paper survey as opposed to having um, somebody interview them about such sensitive topics. So the second type of systematic measurement error is acquiescence bias, which is essentially somebody saying true or false to all the items that are on the question or the survey. Typically this is pretty obvious if you look through the results of a survey, if you've ever had to score one of these and you see somebody that's uh, marked everything true or marked everything false, this would be an example of acquiescence bias. And typically with in-depth psychological assessments, such as a personality inventory, we would look to see if somebody's marked everything true or marked everything false before we'd interpret those results, because if we saw that there was somebody who had signs of acquiescence bias, then their results would be invalid and wouldn't really do us too much good because they'd be misleading and have a lot of built-in systematic error. And then the last systematic error that your text talks about is some leading questions. And this would be something where if you gave some type of either verbal or non-verbal cue to the respondent that they're going to be pleasing you by responding in a certain way, which may may not be their true feelings. So ultimately the way to avoid some of these systematic measurement errors are to try to get somebody else to review the questions, try to use them with different populations, and try to ensure the validity and the reliability of your measures when you're coming up with these types of questions. Measurement error, unfortunately, that's a little bit less predictable is random measurement error. And this is something that's going to be, again, built into all measurement tools to some degree. Unfortunately, these are a little bit harder to deal with, especially if you're going to be working one-on-one -on -one with the clients or doing a single system design. The first random measurement error that your text talks about is regression to the mean. So this would be an example if somebody scored really high in one time, then they may score lower the next time because they're no longer in the situation that caused them to score high the first time. So you can imagine if you were doing some type of inventory of anxiety or depression when you started working with somebody. So typically we get referrals to see people, especially for therapy, if they've had a recent incident that's caused them undue amount of stress. Um, or an unusual amount of stress. So you could see that if you're doing a single system design and you started off measuring how stressed somebody was when they began, just naturally they would regress towards their mean or if they reported high levels of depression to begin with, um, naturally they would kind of regress back towards their mean. You would think that perhaps it was the therapy itself that was causing them to lower their amount of anxiety or depression, but it may just be the situational ups and downs. So you would need longitudinal measure with several measurements to ensure that you're getting valid and reliable results. Also random measurement and error could be just the person's mood. So for instance, if you were doing a single system design again and somebody came in and you were monitoring their anxiety levels and they had just gotten like go from a job or got into a car accident or found out some horrible news about their health, this would be an example of random measurement error. Just because their anxiety is really high one week, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a horrible therapist or that your intervention isn't working, but it could be something extraneous to the treatment itself or extraneous to your therapy. All right, so let's finish up this video with a discussion of reliability and validity. So this is essentially the crux of having a sound measurement and ensuring that you've got quality measurements or that the measurements that the researcher was using for their method 
methods is actually going to be a quality measure for um, trying to get at what they're hoping to assess. So reliability is most commonly associated with the consistency of a measure. So whether or not the measurement tool that's used is going to be able to give you consistent results every time that you use it. So the typical example of people talking about reliability would be like the broken clock. So is a broken clock ever right twice a day? So reliability, ultimately whether it yields consistent or equivalent scores uh, when the phenomenon being measured is not changing. Prerequisite for validity. So you can have a measurement tool that's reliable but not valid but you can't have a measurement tool that's valid and not reliable. So an example of this might be measuring somebody's intelligence again with their head circumference. So I could measure somebody's head circumference to get at their intelligence and it would be a reliable measure, but it wouldn't be a valid result because it wouldn't tell me anything about your intelligence because your head circumference really doesn't have too much to do with your intelligence. Okay, so I'm gonna break the down the different types of reliability that researchers consider when they're developing a new measure or looking at the psychometric properties of a measurement. So test read, test reliability is ultimately one of the more simple versions or simple ways to assess and it's the degree, degree to which two measurements are related. So if I measure your intelligence at time A, it should be related really strongly to your intelligence at time B if we have a test with strong test retest reliability. But there are a number of things that you could see that would probably affect this. So some things could be testing effect, um, something to do with either the testing environment, so perhaps um, you took your ACTs or SATs twice, um, because you did better the second time. Perhaps it was the environment was different. Maybe it was more familiar to you the second time. Um, another way that test retest reliability could be impacted is through previous testing. So researchers would need to make sure that there was an adequate amount of time between the two measurements administration. Um, but for something like a single system design where you're going to be measuring somebody's depression over time, um, that would be something that we would want to be pretty consistent. So we would want the test retest reliability to be rather high on that one. And this way we could accurately assess for variations in the person's symptoms. Okay, so another way of assessing for reliability is internal consistency. So as opposed to looking at somebody's results at time one and comparing it to time two, internal consistency looks at how reliable the measure was within itself. So there's a few different ways that we can assess for this. Um, one way is to do split half reliability. So for instance, if we we're gonna be doing a measure of life satisfaction, if somebody said that they were really satisfied with their life in the first half of the item, they should also say that they're scoring really high on life satisfaction in the second half of the measurement. But there's also a few more sophisticated ways to do this. Um, so one of them is the Kronbach Alpha. And this is a way to look at all the different items that are on a measurement and see how strongly they're related to each other if they're going to be measuring the same construct. So again, if we came up with a measurement that had 20 different items that we're trying to get at anxiety and all the items are related to each other and related to the same underlying construct, then we would expect to have a Kronbach alpha of 0.80 or above. So if they weren't strongly related to each other, then those items may be measuring some other construct out there. But if we were trying to get anxiety, then we would expect to see a strong internal reliability of the measure. So for this week, you're going to be doing the SPSS homework assignment. Part of the assignment was to look at the Kronbach alpha over my X scale. So this would be a kind of like an in vivo exposure of what scale developers, scale developers do. So this is supposed to be an exercise that's loosely based off of what people who develop scales do. So they look at the items and see whether or not they're adding to the consistency of the measurement or if perhaps there's items that really aren't measuring the construct that they think they are and they need to get rid of them or to reword them. Alternate forms of reliability is another form of reliability that can be assessed, but as opposed to measuring somebody at two different times or to looking at the measurement as compared to itself, this is obviously looking at the measure compared to a different measure of the same underlying construct. So an example here could be looking at somebody's results on the ACT and comparing them to the results on the SAT. And ultimately, if both of those tests are trying to get at an understanding of somebody's preparedness for college studies, then they should both be highly related to each other. In social sciences, if it's something like the Beck Depression Inventory and we've got another measure of depression, we would expect that if both of them were truly measuring symptoms of depression, that they would have strong alternate form reliability. So if one measurement said that this person is suffering with a lot of symptoms of depression, then we would expect that the second measurement would also tell us a similar story. And the last form of reliability that I'm going to talk about is inter rater reliability. And this has to do with the people who are using the test. So if there's two different professionals who are using the same test to measure the same thing, 
they should have just about the same score. So you could think of an example as if watching the Olympics. So in the Olympics, you see that there's a panel of judges as opposed to just one judge. So if there's three people who are going to be judging a die, then you would expect that there would be strong inner rate of reliability. So if they were all scoring it really low, um, then you would say that there's probably no problem with the judging. But if one person was scoring it at a 10 and one person was scoring it at a 3, then we would see that there was an obvious flaw in the way that they're going about measuring. An example of this could be the GAF score, and I'm not sure how familiar people were with the DSM-4, but now that we've rolled over to the DSM-5, the global assessment functioning scale has been completely removed from the DSM, and the biggest reason for that is because it had really poor integrator reliability. If you had several different clinicians that were judging somebody's global functioning, you could get widely different scores from the global assessment of functioning scale because the wording was so subjective and ultimately a lot of people say that they didn't know what to give somebody for a GAF score so they kind of just estimated and need to point on it somewhere but something that hopefully is a little bit more systematic approach would be something like measuring somebody's WIS score. With intelligence scores, there's some subjectivity in how you're gonna go about scoring somebody's verbal comprehension. So there is a verbal component to the IQ test. Depending on the administrator's expertise in administering the test, there's a lot of different points that could be gained or lost. When somebody's going about developing a test like this, they need to make sure that regardless of whatever clinician's gonna be administering it, they should have the same scores if they're gonna be using the test in the same way. Um, with the same person. Again, you could also see how this could be an issue if you're going to be doing survey methods. So if I were to interview, for instance, a woman about her sexual history, I might get a wild, wildly different response than if a female colleague of mine were to ask the same person the same type of questions. So if we were to come up with a survey, we would need to make sure that regardless of who is using it, that we're going to get the same results um, depending on who's going to be rating the construct that we're trying to measure. Okay, so reliability is essentially a precursor to validity. So we need to make sure that a test is reliable in order for it to be valid. So just like reliability, there's a lot of different forms that we can assess for validity on. And as opposed to reliability, which is the consistency of a measure, validity is the accuracy of a measure. If you were to think about it as a dartboard, reliability would be if all of the darts hit the dartboard in the same spot, but it wasn't the bullseye. So if we're trying to hit the bullseye, that would be the validity of the measurement. So let me start off with explaining what face validity is. So whether or not the measurement looks like it's supposed to be measuring what it is intended to measure. Examples here are how much did you drink last week? Have you had any difficulty sleeping over the past week? These could be good screening questions for depressed mood or global functioning. And we could would say that it was probably a valid type questions for either one of those, at least on their face. But content validity is something that's a little bit more in depth. So this is whether or not the measure covers the full range of concepts meaning. So when you're trying to figure out a scale to use or if you're gonna be developing a scale, you wanna make sure that it's got enough items on it that it's gonna measure the full concept that you're trying to understand but not that it's got too many questions that it's gonna distract the user or not really be user friendly. I'm just gonna give an example here and maybe some of you would know what this is getting at. Which item of these four doesn't seem to match? So the four items that I have here, are, does your child avoid eye contact? Does your child hide food in his or her room? Does the child make bizarre hand gestures? And is your child irritated by certain textures? So if anybody has had any type of expertise in working with children, you would probably notice that one of these items doesn't fit, which would be the second item. So does your child hide food in his or her room? The other three items on here seem to be measuring autism spectrum disorder. So avoiding eye contact, making bizarre hand gestures, irritated by certain textures. We would expect that uh, most experts in the field would agree that those three items are strongly related to autism spectrum disorder um, versus hiding food in their room could be something more along the lines of neglect or attachment type disorders. So how could you go about assessing whether or not your measurement had content validity? Typically it's coming down to an expert's judgment. Okay, so criterion validity is something that's related to construct validity. It's essentially a measurement of whether or not the item is strongly related to other validated measures in the field and whether it may have predictive qualities. So um, an example here might be if you were to look at a measurement that had strong criterion validity, you might want to look at how it's fared as maybe the back anxiety inventory, which is the gold standard in the field. And if you were to look at a measurement and it had strong criterion validity uh, for depression, we might want to see whether or not uh, a sample scored similarly on the Beck Depression Inventory as it did to this new measurement. Likewise, predictive validity um, is a type of criterion validity 
which would see whether or not the measurement tool that you're using had any type of predictive qualities in trying to predict future behaviors. So some examples of this might be like the SAT or the ACT. We're trying to predict how well somebody's going to be doing in college based on their scores on these tests. So there should be a strong correlation between the ACT score and college performance. Unfortunately, that correlation isn't as strong as most people like to think it is. Typically, the better predictor of college performance is high school performance. And the ACT wasn't really developed as a test that's supposed to predict college performance. Fortunately, it's not really a valid measure. Um, a lot of people are arguing that we should probably get rid of it.